Okay, is that it? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> Make sure we've got everything else out of the way here. Yep, let me get back on my system. So of course, I've, I've got this little toy here. Had to show it at least to people. How many people have tried Google Glass so far? Eh, a fairly good number. So I was gonna do just a quick little fun thing with it. So I've got it in the OK Glass mode. OK Glass, take a picture. OK Glass, share with Twitter. There you go, there's no tweet with it. <laughs> I had to do that just for some fun to begin with. Okay. So at any rate, um, I'm Lance Gleason. Um, the small company called Polyglot Programming. We do Ruby consulting primarily, and we get into a few other languages from time to time. How many people here have actually seen me speak before? Okay, so we have a few. Um, since the dealer magic guys are here tonight, and I know that at least one of their people came from ThoughtWorks, I wanted to, I'm gonna start off with one of my beginnings that I usually do on these talks, and for those that have ever already heard it, just kind of bear through it for a second. So, how many people here, especially the ones that have not seen me speak, how many people here have done, have heard of extreme programming? Okay, so a fairly good number. And how many people here have heard of pair programming? Okay, how many people here do pair programming on a regular basis? Okay, so a decent number. Well, about two years ago when um, I went independent, I had a dilemma because quite often you run into clients where they don't have the budget to pay for a dev pair. So, but I really, I love pair programming. It's fun to do. So I was trying to figure out what do you do when you don't have somebody else to program with? And I looked over. I was in my home office, looked over, and I saw this. How many people here obviously have a cat? Yes. And, um, <laughs> you know, and I thought about something. Allie from the time, so my cat's name is Allie, and she, from the time she was a kitten, she just loved technology. I mean, she would sleep in my laptop bags. She would sleep on top of the laptop when it was warm. Um, whenever I was programming, she would come up and she would like butt up against it. She'd be trying to see what's going on. I thought, I wonder if there's more to this than just um, her wanting attention from me. I think she likes the computer. So what if we could take extreme programming to the next level and try per programming? So here we are getting ready for a per programming session. Um, we've taken care of like all the, you know, we're still following the best practices here in your dev pair. Each one needs to have a comfortable chair. Um, we're using the single keyboard approach for this, so we still have one keyboard. And it's been really interesting trying this because what I found out was that when Allie jumps on my lap, it's not because she wants attention, it's because I'm doing something stupid. And cats, believe it or not, they can tell when you're, they can actually see what's going on without looking at the screen which I found to be quite amazing. That's why she can sleep and then all of a sudden she'll end up in my lap because, oh, yep, I forgot to put a test on that. Um, now, some people have said, well, what's the difference between that and rubber duck programming? And yeah, you could say that, but here's the thing. She can also drive. We were having a really gnarly debugging session one night and she just got right up at the keyboard. She said, nope, this is how you do it. And she found a bug. So we're trying that out. It's kind of been fun to try. Um, we have dogs. We were thinking about, well, could, so we're being very discriminatory towards, just, towards dogs because we're just including cats. But this is kind of the hierarchy in our house. The cat is definitely the smart alpha. The dogs are just kind of minions. Um, but maybe somebody else has different results with that. Um, I blogged about it. And <laughs> there's a website for it. <laughs> And I promise I will not do this routine ever again at Planner uh, <laughs> Review Users Group because now I've worn it out completely. So, okay. But anyways, per programming, it's fun. Try it out sometime. Um, okay, on to actually what we're here to talk about. Search. How many people here have needed, have put search in some way, shape, or form in, into their applications? 
Okay, so a decent number. Um, now, I probably should ask as well, because how many people here have been programming for a while and not needed to put search in their applications? Interesting. I actually had run into a scenario where myself even, I had not, I've done some search, but nothing that was overly advanced for a number of years. I just didn't have applications that required them. And then a couple of years ago, ran into this and found it was kind of interesting learning about what are the nomenclatures in search and what are the things you need and don't need and so on with that. So specifically though, let's talk about active record searches. Classic scenario is something where, you know, you might start off with, you have a table and they have a bunch of users and you're trying to find Beavis in that table. So a standard query that you might use with active record is user where name equals Beavis and you'll get Beavis back. But then what happens when you need to, you want to do something like this. I want to type in just B E A and get Beavis back. What do you do? Well, you're still really, you still can do this in the database. You could do a query like this. Just basically use a like clause, give it a partial uh, string, and you'll get Beavis. Life will be good. That's all fine and dandy, but now let's say that we have this scenario. We have a person, a table that has a bunch of people, persons. My phone is actually going off here. Whoa, there we go. And let's say that this per person has an action called eat, but we would like to search on eating and get all the results that have eat. That's when you get into stemming. Now, how many people are familiar with what stemming is and have used that before? Okay, so a few. So for those that haven't, that, I remember when I was first introduced to that, it's like stemming, what is that? That is stemming. Stemming is taking one, being able to use multiple synonyms or multiple words that have the same meaning to search for another. Now, you really don't necessarily need to have another search technology or apply a search technology to your database to do stemming. With some caveats, if you have Postgres, Stemming is built in. If you have MongoDB, you also have stemming. And to a certain degree, and this one's a little bit on the edge, but React also supports it. And there probably are some others, but if you're on MySQL, it does not. The problem with it is your implementation is gonna be inconsistent, especially if you have multiple Data, database backends that you're going to use with it. And if you get any significant number of records in your data store, it's going to be slow. So what can we do? How do we solve that? Well, one approach is to use Apache Solar. How many people here have used Solar for something or are familiar with what Solar is? Okay, a few. What Apache Solar is, is it's a search indexing engine implemented in Java. I know I said the J word. <laughs> and in essence, it basically runs this small server that just runs on a port, not unlike like a database or something like that, on a machine. And if you're in the Ruby world, you would quite, you're probably going to use Sunspot with that. I don't know, has anybody here done used Solar in Ruby and not used Sunspot? Okay, so one person. It'd be interesting to know what that scenario is, but there probably are, obviously. What's that? Oh, you were not using Active Record. Ah, that, that would be a good reason. Yep. That is actually one of the weaknesses of Sunspot. Good point. Okay, so great. This talk actually isn't about solar, it's not about Sunspot, but what are the strengths of that tool and why would I use it? I mean, as much as I'm gonna tell you about one tool, it doesn't mean you should always use it. It supports faceted search. Um, now what faceted search is, and I'm gonna murder this a little bit, but the idea behind it is, is that you're 
breaking up your search terms by facets. So for example, you might have a bunch of people and one facet may be their sex. Are they male or are they female? Another facet might be the city. And so being able to specify and use facets in your search, that is something that um, <coughs> Solar does support. Multilingual support. How many people here are developing applications that need to support more than one language? A few. Field weighting. What this refers to is, let's say you are searching, you have a bunch of documents and they have a title and then a body. You might want to say, if I'm searching across both the body text and the title text, I might want the title text results to have a higher ranking and to appear first as more significant. Auto-suggest, which I think everybody is probably fairly familiar with what that is, being able to suggest alternate, alternative results. Geospatial search, pretty self-explanatory. Find similar. If you give it one search term, for example, if you're searching for dogs, maybe it would also show different breeds like golden retrievers and shizus. I have to say shizus because we have two. Um, did you mean? You give it a term that's a misspelling of a word, does it give you the right one? Like if you spell Illinois incorrectly, it actually says, did you mean Illinois, the proper spelling? And rich document support. And what I mean with this is that it has a, basically an adapter that you can plug into it to allow you to very easily index PDFs or <coughs> other types of document formats. And of course, our old favorite, stemming. One other big strength of it, testability. How many people here are actively, actively run unit tests against their code? Wow, I'm surprised that number is not higher. If you're one of the people that, that is saying no, you should be. <laughs> um, but Solar, because of the fact that you can, you can basically spin it up on a local server, if you have code that's actually running against a Solar to do searching, you can integrate that in with your test suite very easily. And that is a, a key, definitely an advantage of this framework. Or rather, this tool is not a framework, really. But so what are the weaknesses? A number one, scaling. Now, how many people here have actually scaled out any applications that use solar? Yeah, nobody. <laughs> Can you do it? Yes. But you're gonna, it's going to be a lot of work to make that happen. Along with scaling, index distribution and partitions. Can you do it? Yes. But is it going to be a lot of work? Yes. Index replication, the same thing. Now let me explain what these two are. The distribution and partition would be, let's say you want to basically have one server handle one set of indexes and have another server handle another set of indexes. That's what we're talking about there. You're going to have to do a lot of work to make that happen using that as a scaling strategy. Index replication being that we're just going to basically replicate the index amongst multiple instances. Again, none of this is supported out of the box you're going to have to create something to make that happen if you're using solar. So and along with that, then, high availability, you can do it. But it, again, it's going to take a lot of work. And your cost is going to be much higher. So what's another solution? What's another tool we could use? Well, Amazon Cloud Search. So how many people here have used Amazon, any of the Amazon um, services, S3, AWS. OK, so a few people have. It's definitely, it's a, it's a pretty powerful tool. It's an, it's, it's an, it definitely has a lot of advantages. Um, so you could combine that, add Asari to it, and then act, add active Asari to it. These are two gems that basically do the same thing that kind of, well, I should say kind of the same thing that Sunspot does for solar. So what are the strengths with that solution? It does support faceted searching. It does support field weighting. 
It does have rich document support, and it also does support stemming. And then, but here's the big one. Index distribution and partitions, it's taken care of for you. This is one of the, those Amazon services that just kind of, you throw stuff up there, and when it needs to scale out, and it needs to scale between multiple instances, you don't even worry about it. They take care of it for you. Index replication, you don't worry about it. You just send stuff up there. They take care of it, all based on your traffic. High availability, this is the same mechanism that, from what I understand, Amazon uses with their own search. It's designed to be highly available. And the cost at scale. On the surface, it looks like it's more expensive because compared to the cost of just standing up one server and hosting your own Sunspot instance or using one of the third providers on Heroku, you might say, well, oh no, Sunspot's cheaper. Or sorry, Solar is cheaper using, with, using Sunspot or something like that. That's really not true, though, when you start factoring in the cost of labor and the cost of what you're going to spend for, to have your developers basically build out the, all of that infrastructure to be able to scale this thing out. But it does have some weaknesses, and it's not the tool that everybody should use. This one, I think, is probably one of the biggest Achilles heels, in my opinion, which is multilingual support. Now, maybe for this group, it's not that big of a deal, because it sounds like a lot of people are not developing applications for anything outside of the US market. But if you have customers in Europe or some other place like that, then this could basically stop you cold from even considering this as a solution. It does not have auto-suggest. It does not have find similar. And it does not have did you mean. They've kind of stripped out all these other use cases and they've said, let's stay with the simpler ones. So if you need to scale, you don't need to support other languages, and you don't need these features, it's a really good tool, and it's one that you might want to consider using. It is also proprietary. And testability is a challenge with it. The best thing you can do if you're using it is to basically um, mock out your calls going out to Amazon. Or you might want to, you might have a suite that actually hits your service, but in a second, we'll actually talk about why that probably is not going to be ideal. OK, so how many people here have actually looked at Cloud Search or played with it at all? Wow, nobody. OK. <laughs> well, before I got involved in the project where I actually worked with this, I hadn't either. So with Cloud Search, we have a concept of a domain. A domain is basically, the, the closest analogy that I could come up with for an Amazon domain is it's very similar to what you would use a table for in SQL. It is this domain, so to speak, for lack of a better term, that has a bunch of index fields that you search on. Now, the index fields that they give you, they basically are left with, you have three different types you can choose from. You have a uint, 32-bit unsigned integer, a literal. A literal field is one that you must search on for a complete exact match with. And text fields. Those are, we're all familiar with text. That can be a long, a large bit of text that you can do, you can search across a bunch of stuff with. And you can do partial text searches and all that other fun stuff. Within each of these, they have a few limitations. And I'll be honest, I'm not crazy about this diagram here. Um, these R's, what these stand for are, these are items that are basically required and they you cannot change them. So by default, a uint, it re requires and defaults and doesn't allow you to change turning these features on. Now, what are these features that I'm talking about here? Search is stating that this field can be searched on. You're indexing things in here, and you can search on this field. Faceting 
kind of as it would imply, is saying that this is a field that we can allow you to do faceted searches on. And then result, which is kind of an interesting one, says that when you get your results back, it will include whatever the matching records were that were in this index field. And that's kind of an interesting point, I think, to just briefly go into because with like, for example, solar, and I'll be honest, I've never gotten really deep into the bowels. I've usually just used the gem. Generally, the way that's working is you're indexing a bunch of fields in solar. You do a search. It gives it's giving Sunspot a list of IDs back, and then the IDs are being hydrated from active records. So it's basically then grabbing the ID, doing a quick query by ID into the database, and then handing you the complete record. But in certain usage scenarios, you could actually bypass that entirely, where you could have one system that indexes everything in Amazon Cloud Search, and then you can have another that just hits Cloud Search but does not have to have a database dependency. Amazon doesn't recommend that, but I think it's a cool usage scenario. Now, one thing I don't fully understand with their implementation is why all of these, these literals here, are... I understand why they're optional, but they don't seem to have anything that checks to see if you have all of them turned off at the same time, which is a little goofy because why would you want to store something, but then if you can never search on it and you can never get a result back, why do you have it in there? And you know I have no facet, it's just dead data. I, maybe they're going to change that at some point, but that, I always found that to be slightly goofy. Okay. Just like S3 or something else, the way they do the access controls to your search index is going to be via IP-based permissions. There's no concept of having all like a bunch of passwords to access it or anything else like that. It's basically allow this IP to get at it and it can go to town. Okay, so if we're not using Asari or Active Asari, what does a request look like that may add and remove a record? This JSON, basically. You're going to have some things in here, and it's going to be like, add this, give it an ID, give it a title, maybe some other, you know, give it your field names and give it some data that goes in the fields. And you might have another delete thing that goes like this. But you're basically, if you're using it raw, you're going to have to construct all this somehow. All right, now let's say we want to add some indexes again. If you're just working directly with the Amazon API, none of, the, none of these other gems, you're going to create something that's probably going to look like this. Kind of ugly. Doable, but ugly. Well, everybody's quiet tonight. <laughs> what? <laughs> Troll. There we go. Searching. Okay, this is a little bit small. I could probably, I'll just leave that for now. The point being that you're going to have to basically custom create some sort of a search string. You're going to have to specify your domain. You're going to have to know as a unique ID that when you create a search domain you, that Amazon gets you, you're going to have to know that. And then you're going to have to construct some sort of a search query. And this is actually, for those that are curious, this is actually a search query that goes across all of your text fields. And you're going to get a result that's going to look something like this. Which, it's not bad, but you're going to have to parse through that. And especially if this happened to, if this was one that was actually getting results back along with the IDs, you would have a bunch of stuff here that you would have to parse and you would have to use like some hash accesses and things like that. Again, not horrible, but not as convenient as it would like it to be. So, if you were to just say, I'm going to use Cloud Search and not worry about any of these other gems, you can do it, but you're going to have to manage your domain names. You're going to have to manage domain IDs for each one of those domain names. And those IDs being that Amazon, in essence, is when you create a domain, they're going to give you a unique ID back. 
boilerplate code for your searches, calls to update your search indexes, and your access permissions. All that stuff, you're going to have to figure out a way to set that with the Amazon API. And I haven't even showed you all the other stuff that goes along with that, etc. But there is a better way. There is an easier way. Use Active Asari. Put this in your gem file. Configure a couple of things here. Um, you're going to give it your AWS access key. And you're going to see in a second why we're going to do that, which basically will allow Asari to create domains for you. Acquire a couple other things, including some config files. You're going to create an active Asari .yaml file. And in that, you're going to set a couple of things. This should look to everybody very similar to a lot of other Rails-style configuration files. The key thing to kind of understand with this, though, is you're, also, you're going to set this thing called the domain prefix. What this is is, let's say that you have, which probably a lot of people do, you have a dev environment, you have a staging environment, and you have a production environment. If you're using the same Amazon account to create search domains and you give them all the same do search domain name, you're going to have no easy way to differentiate them, depending on which environment you're in. This prefix is automatically placed when we create domains in front of that domain name, depending on the environment you're in, so that it can keep those separated. You also configure what you want your access permissions to be. Then you basically create a configuration file to set up your domains and your search indexes on that. This is, it's a bit verbose. Um, there probably is a better way to do this. We, this is obviously a work, it's a release gem, but it's always a work in progress. But the idea here is this, you have a model that you've created somewhere, and, but you wanna call, you wanna call that, you wanna call this a domain, test model. Under this test model, you, you will have a index field called name, you might have one called amount, last updated, and you're going to want to set for each one of those then an index field type of something like text or uint, and then any optional values that you might want to set on that that are actually settable. And there is a bug in this slide which is actually right now lifted from the documentation in the gem because in the bug being that, for example, text fields are always search enabled, so that's kind of pedantic. That's always search enabled for uint, so that's pedantic. Actually, the only one that, that would allow us to set any of these things that we're setting here in this example is right here. <laughs> and we haven't set it. So that'll be fixed sometime. I noticed that right before the talk here. But the idea being that you just configure it and then run a migration. Now, it's on our roadmap to turn this into a rake file at some point in the gem. But right now, you can programmatically do this, where you basically, whenever you grab an instance of the migrations object and you migrate all, it takes all the configuration files from your activeasari.yaml and your activeasari.config.yaml, and if the domain already exists, it doesn't recreate it, but it either creates or updates your access permissions and any of the index fields listed for those domains. So instead of doing all the other glue code that you normally have to do, you just create the configuration files, run the migration, and it's the closest thing you can get to an active record style migration. It just takes care of it for you. This is the one big gotcha though with it. This is not a limitation of, a direct limitation of a sorry or active a sorry. This is how Amazon Cloud Search works. Amazon Cloud Search does a lot of things very well. It auto scales for you. It takes care of a lot of things behind the scenes for you. But when you make changes to indexes, they can take up to 30 minutes until it's finished everything, even when you're creating just a brand new domain. So that is the drawback. And that is also why I say testability is not the strongest suit. Testing, dire well, sorry, testing directly against an Amazon Cloud Search instance is not necessarily something I, I would always recommend doing if you want fast feedback unless you're not doing a lot of changes to your search indexes and you're able to keep a fairly clean index hanging around somewhere that's easy to repeat. 
IE that doesn't have a lot of dirty data that you're then going to have to delete or do something else like that with. Okay, so in your model now, you've specified I've got a domain, I've got index, value, index items on the domain, index fields, and I've got my permissions and all that stuff sorted out. Any model now that you want to associate with the domain, you hook up via these three lines. You include active, sorry, active record. You have to do that. The second line, we tried to sort of abstract that out a little bit better, but found that at least for, so far, this was the only way to get this to work reliably was that we basically, what this is saying is, if you're in your test environment, we don't recommend testing against active Asari. So if you're, you're in Rails MP equals test, don't send all your search requests up into the cloud search. It's going to slow down your unit tests, and you shouldn't be doing that. So we turn it off. It's basically just turning that off. And then tell active Asari to index that. And because it's actually running this code on load and so on, the only really real way to do this is you have to just include these three lines, which is slightly verbose. Love to figure out a way to refactor that and make it better. But it is where it's at, at least right now, and it does work for what we've been using it for. What that just give, gave you, though, is that all transactions now that you run in your active record model that you just hooked up with that small amount of code now is completely synced up with Cloud Search. In other words, so now whenever you do an add, whenever you do a delete, and whenever you do an update, it's automatically update. It's already it's automatically sent up to Amazon Cloud Search, and Amazon is automatically re-indexing that for you, which is actually another advantage of Cloud Search over um, Sunspot because with Sunspot you're pretty much or sorry, Solar technically with Solar you have to usually rerun the indexes at some interval when you start adding new data in. All right, so how do you use it now? You've got the data up there. How do you do a search? Well, if you want to do just a basic search across all of your text fields, you might do something like this. And what this is basically doing here is you're actually not going to the active record look, the active record object directly with your search like you would with Sunspot. This is where it diff we differ at this point in this project. You basically go against the domain. You say, I want to search against this domain. Active Asari takes care of figuring out which dev prefix, which unique Amazon ID is associated with that, because it's actually doing that back end heavy work for you. Give it this string, and then it's going to give you a result set back. And in that result set, you're going to have different fields. And I'll show you an example of that in just a minute. Amazon also has this concept of what they call a binary or a Boolean search. A Boolean search when you do one, instead of searching across just all the text fields, you have to specify which fields you want to search on individually. Boolean searches are the only way to search against a uint or a literal, but they can also include text fields. And so this is just an example of one where you're saying, on the Honey Badger domain object here, I want to search the name field for Beavis, and you're just telling it it's a Boolean type of query. Your result, and this is going to be evil, would look something like this. I say evil, but it's really not. The idea here being basically this. You're going to get an ID back. You're going to get basically a hash back with the ID values that are associated with, with each of these records that you indexed. And then you're going to get this thing called an active Asari result object. All that that's doing is it's wrapping that hash result into something that's a little bit easier to use. It'll give you the raw result as a hash, but then it also gives you basically the methods. It ba basically creates a bunch of methods off of those objects that you can just individually read. And when I say individually read, you can just access them like you would an active record attribute or something like that. Where, for example, if you had the name field, you could basically grab that record ID and then grab the name field off of that dot name. All Asari methods are also available when you're using Active Asari. Asari is the framework that we built Active Asari on. It basically 
it did some of the legwork for, Asari will give you quite a bit of the legwork for searching in the cloud. Active Asari does the rest as far as helping you to manage your domains and make searching a little bit easier. And between the two, they kind of give you a complete package. So what's on the roadmap? When we created Active Asari, um, Active Asari is an opinionated framework. And when we created it, I was initially we were thinking about do we actually include it within the Asari project and do a big pull request, but it seemed opinionated enough where we said, well, let's not for the time being. But since that time, the maintainer of the Asari project has said, why don't you just merge this into Asari? And so at some point when we get time, we may actually look at doing that. Adding rake tests for migrations, that's definitely on the roadmap. And who knows, there's other things that we'll find as we actually get this further into production and being used on in more projects and so on with that. You can get at it with the Active Asari gem. You can do a search for in the Ruby gems for Active Asari, and you'll find it. And there's also, it's an open, it's up on GitHub as well. And that is pretty much it. Um, really quiet group today. Wow. So, all right. <laughs> At any rate, um, anybody have any questions? Yeah. Did you think about the Elasticsearch at all when you're doing this? So you have Solar and you have the Cloud, but Elasticsearch is like another indexing tool, right? Yeah, it's, I'll be honest, we didn't look at, a, at active Elasticsearch with this. I don't think, to be honest with you, I can't comment enough on Elasticsearch to tell you. I, I know that when we were doing our research, it seemed like this was the right, this at least solved, scratched the itch that we needed to with it. I think Elasticsearch takes care of a slightly different problem, if I'm not mistaken. It seemed to be a lot like Solar to me. Okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, I don't know, though. It, right. I used it at the company, but I never used Solar. Oh, wait, wait, sorry, never mind. I'm, I was having a slight brain. <laughs> yeah, Elasticsearch is solar. Sorry, Elasticsearch is solar, basically. Oh, is it? Yes, okay. yes. Elasti and, and Elasticsearch is not a, a SaaS solution. It's not a SaaS solution. Right. You can, there are providers that will, I think, that will do Elasticsearch as SaaS, but it's really more of a, it's more of a, it's basically a solar-based thing, and we wanted to use the Amazon ecosystem because of the fact that we're already in Amazon, and it offered a lot of the things we needed, so we said, let's just go ahead and go with that. So that was part of the choice behind this. But it's not, Elasticsearch is not a bad, again, it's not a bad solution at all with that. It's yeah. sort of a packaged up solar. Uh, you don't have to worry yeah. about some of the, uh, the partitioning things that he was talking about. Uh, right. What's a good rule of thumb for someone, you know, I mean, obviously solar's been around for a while. So the partitioning, what's a good rule of thumb where just throwing more RAM and faster hard drives and just making the solar server beefier to like where you're actually going to scale it through those other techniques? Honestly, I, I don't know that I could tell you to be exact with that. I think that for my client, they were using, they've been using solar. They've been using one of the providers off of Heroku. And um, the one that actually prompted the development of this, they just basically said, we've already got a lot of other stuff in Amazon, and this looks like it's going to scale a lot better. Why don't we just move over to this and not have to deal with it? So it's more of a gut reaction than a raw solar can't possibly keep up with this load. Right. And solar, I mean, it's not to say there are big installations of solar, and I'm not going to sit there and say that solar cannot solve your problem because for search, it can. And in fact, if you need to do multi, if you need to have basically any other language supported besides English, you're kind of stuck. You're going to have to use it at this point because Amazon does not support any other language other than English. Right. It's kind of like the cost trade-off. Like, when do you change platforms versus throwing more hardware at your current platform that's working? Right? Exactly. And, yeah, thanks. Any other questions? No other questions. Hmm. Caching algorithms do you have? I noticed that the, there was like Amazon something, HMAC 256 AES or something in that big long option string, it caught my eye. To be honest with you, there may be a choice that deep in there somewhere, but we've just used the default. <laughs> so, but there could be something deeper as you go further along.
Yeah. And let's just comment on something you said earlier. Solar doesn't necessarily require you to rebuild uh, every time you add something, and it does have incremental indexing. It does have that, okay. Yeah. It seems like quite a bit when, at least some of the, the implementations I've had, it seemed like you had to quite often, though, do that. But yeah, all right, that's a fair point. It's, it's a recommendation to keep the index size down. Yes. Uh, yes. Incremental indexing builds a larger index, but then you, you then recalculate your index from time to time to keep to recompress it. Right, right, okay, to do that, yep. What? One over there? What's the latency like for getting stuff in and out of the index? I mean, if you, if you add a record, is it immediately available to be searched upon, or is there a delay? There is a delay, but to be honest, I haven't measured it, because in most of the use cases I've, I've needed to use it for, it wasn't like we needed immediate availability where it mattered. I mean, within five minutes, it's going to be there. That I can pretty much guarantee you because those have been our use cases, but I haven't, I can't tell you exactly is it going to be, it can be guaranteed a minute or something like that. Good question. Yeah. Yeah, it uh, hooks for a delayed job or, um, or rescue to run the indexes as you can see. Um, probably just do that. Why would you, wait, to run the, why would you need to do that? So that you're not tying up the thread. Oh, because it's, he's, he's reacting to the 30 minute thing. Well, you would only are you you're, you're are you talking in relation to the thirty minute when you're actually running the migration on that? I mean, or no, when you're you, so you have a customer comes in, they update a record, and yep. then you're you're indexing a lot of data on that record, right? Maybe you're touching other records in the database, and you have to build out something. So in our case, we have a vehicle, and you have to touch a dealership, and it's offers, and a whole suite of other information. You don't want to tie up the user thread by calculating that data and sending it off especially if you're not wanting to, um, if you want to limit the number of simultaneous processes you have running on your server. Right, so when you're, when you're actually indexing something though, when you're adding a new record into Amazon Cloud Search though, it's basically just fire it off and then you just get a quick response back. You're not, yeah, you're not gonna be waiting for it to finish indexing that. That connection could go down, you could, there, there are plenty of different enterprises. You could probably just use delay job. I mean, this is just uh, it, you yeah. know, it's a first so it's class good. model mix in. Right. I mean, if you need that kind of durability, certainly, obviously, yeah, you could do something like that. Where between, I mean, under the under the hood, what's happening basically is it's go, it's it's putting a hook in. So after it's actually persisted it to the database, then it's sending it up to index it. Right. So we're not really aiming at this point, at least. The gem is not. Doing something crazy like, okay, we're also going to put a delayed job in there to monitor and make 100% sure that this is completely successful, but that is something that could be added to this later on. But, um, any other questions? Is this your gem lands? Uh, primary, right now I'm the only author on it, okay. but um, it's open for other people to basically hack away on. It's both of them or just the active? Well, actually, no. I authored Active Asari, but Asari is actually maintained by Tommy Morgan, um, who's with Treehouse Software. He's actually here in Atlanta, too, but I've never met him. Or if I have, I don't remember. I need to let go. Tommy, let's just go have, let's do a hack session and combine these two or something like that. Call it a conference. The what? Asari Conf. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Asari Conf, uh, next month, um, <laughs> South Africa. <laughs> That'd be good. Yeah, January 1st. Okay, and I've got a few t-shirts to give out, actually, too. So, all right. Who wants a large? <laughs> what does it say? Is it, is it <laughs> Yeah. Large? Yeah. Okay, who wants a... Let's see here. I don't think I have smalls. I have a medium. Anybody want a medium? There you go. Hand up. Whoa! <laughs> And let's see here, a XL. <laughs> you don't need an XL. XL, you got it. Whoa. <laughs> there we go, Adrian gets that one. I saw it coming for the camp. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sorry, it's pretty pre soil. No, just kidding. Just from the ground. Large. Anybody want large? Yeah, that's the Wow, nobody wants free swag. This is amazing. Wow. <laughs> there we go, large. Oh. <laughs> it's like the brave skin. All right, that's it. I guess thank you so much.
We hope you've enjoyed this video presentation of a talk given at a monthly Atlanta Ruby Users Group meeting. This video has been sponsored by Rietta Incorporated. As an Atlanta-based Rails consultancy, Rietta transforms high-level business problems into technical solutions. For more videos like this one, please see the ATL RUG videos playlist.